I've started recording my uh, video, and now I'm recording my audio. I am recording my audio as well and trying to figure out where notifications are popping up on my screen. There they are. Okay. <laughs> Wherever they want to. Ready? Yep. Okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 425, Naming Spacecraft. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly fact-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good, but a little sad. At the time that we are recording this show, we do not know what happened to the lander from the little lander that could from Europe. It's it's true. We're we're both glued to our various feeds, waiting to see if little Chaparelli decides to call home. Uh, it was yeah. turned out to be such a good day. There was there's three separate spacecraft carrying human beings in space right now, plus a new mission arriving at Mars. It's a very good day for space. Well, for human space, okay. um, well, ExoMars did successfully yeah. Half implant okay. itself in orbit. So uh, we we have one new orbiter going round and round Mars, but it's the surface where you really want to be to do cool stuff and seeing what's in the dirt yeah. and um well let's get on with the show because it's kind of relevant so how have you ever noticed that spacecraft missions have some pretty cool names how does anyone decide what to call these things anyway all right pamela so uh this is yours and i guess it's sort of appropriate because it once again you're going to be uh at the uh the dps meeting was at but yes was at yes so you so all the new missions all the new information coming back from new horizons and Cassini and things like that. So, um, you put this you put this one on the on the docket. So let's talk a bit about uh, about how spacecraft get their names. Well, what's what's always fascinating is there's no one way that it happens. And uh, as you and I have experienced, we went through and we did a whole series for a while of missions where you have a famous human. Famous human does amazing science to become famous human and then nasa commemorates famous human by naming a spacecraft after said human usually only after the human uh, has died and the spacecraft has lived so so for instance there was the gamma ray telescope called glast up until after it had successfully returned first light at which point glast got renamed fermi uh, Hubble was not called Hubble until after it was in space, at which point it became Hubble. Chandra was That's the same weird. thing. Good. Hold on, let's go back for one second. So the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, right, the telescope that we're most familiar with, it wasn't called Hubble until it was actually operating, getting first light. And and so there was this long tradition that it was a curse to to name a telescope after a human until afterwards yep. and the, the the mission that really broke that was the james webb space telescope uh and there was a whole lot of people that were like oh they shouldn't have done that because no matter how much of a scientist you are there's this small little linnate part of your lizard brain that insists upon being superstitious you're jinxing it and and the lizard brain part was going no no no, no don't do that don't, yeah. no 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 bad bad and, and the thing was, they kind of opened the floodgate once they named JWST after James Webb. And now we have little Chaparelli, again, human, and the spacecraft died. Maybe. Maybe. We don't yeah, know yet. We don't know yet. We'll talk in a, we'll talk in a week. So there was this, this fabulous tradition of you try and come up with a good acronym failing finding a good acronym you just come up with a good noun and you launch and you go or you wait until you've launched and you work and then you name yourself after a famous human so is is that really the key like the 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 best thing to get the best name is either like a 
an acronym that sounds super cool and is kind of relevant to the mission, or you name the mission after a famous human being that was somewhat, somewhat related to the mission. And if you could like really knock it out of the park, you would have an Do acronym. Both. Yeah, you'd have an acronym that is relevant to the name of a person, but is also, you know, breaks apart into something that makes sense for the mission as well. I don't so, know if that's been pulled so off yet. There, there's famous things like WMAP, which was originally just MAP, and then they wanted to add Wilkinson to it because of all of his amazing science. So it became the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or WMAP. Um, but I have to admit, my my sweet spot is for all of these missions that force acronyms. Yes. Awesome names. Um, I think my favorite has to be Osiris Rex, which is the coolest name ever. Um, and the most forced acronym, because it's the Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer. As opposed to the Rock Grabber Retriever, or the Bring a Rock Back to Earth, the Asteroid Retrieval Mission, ARM. Yeah. That's what I'd call it. I'd call it the ARM. The asteroid retrieval mission, but instead it got Osiris. So what's that again? It's the Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer. But what does Osiris mean in like how is that relevant to the mission? It's cool. <laughs> and I mean, then Rex? So like that just turns it into like the the king of all Right, so Osi Rex is king. Osiris and is? Osiris was an Egyptian god. Yes, god so king. You have you have the god of the underworld and the afterlife, who has been turned into a king. Right. Um. It it's just cool. Yeah. It, it's forced. It's but... super forced. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I you have Messenger right there with it. I don't know how many times I've had to go through and rewrite where someone has written Messenger for the Mercury exploration mission with just a capital M and then all the rest of the letters lowercase. But no, um, it should actually be capital M, lowercase e, capital S, capital S, capital E, lowercase n, capital G, lowercase e, capital R. No one does that. So they do just make it all capital and it stands for the mercury surface space environment geochemistry and ranging so right and so yeah. it was before it was like messenger and then they decided to make it sound like a word and so they added the extra parts there's one that that i think has been badly misnamed that's up right now and that's Which the that? discover satellite Which the discover Oh yeah, right. It's, it's one of the Earth imaging ones. Yeah, that yeah. Let me, it let me... looks. Everyone just calls it Discover. Uh, I know, but it's they've they've kept the spelling. So it's the Deep Space Climate Observatory, right? But the acronym is D S C O V R. So observe. Yeah. No. No, I'm going to say that, that the naming on that one just like should have just gone the whole distance and just said, call it Discover, D I S C O V E R. That's okay with little I's and little E's, and we'll forget about that and we'll just do it all in uppercase or cap, up, capital D, lowercase, over. But, uh, but this is just, this is tough. Like, I literally have to look it up every single time I'm writing about it. And is it D I S? cover is it anyway yeah no what's what's a vowel here and there these are these are important <laughs> <laughs> so so one final uh mashup mission is is beppo sex do you know that one well that's the mercury mission so uh, that that's among other things but do you know its name no so so beppo oh, there's beppo colombo right so Beppo was the physicist Gia Peppo Beppo. I'm going to destroy this. I apologize to people who speak uh, Italian. Uh, Ascialali, Lani. I'm not sure how to say this. It's an Italian name that I'm sure sounds really amazing when pronounced by someone who speaks Italian. And then the SACS part stands for Satellite Per Astronomy Oraggi X. 
which means satellite for x-ray astronomy. So you combine the satellite for x-ray astronomy, but written in Italian so that you get Sachs with Beppo, who is the nickname for this fabulous scientist, and you get Beppo Sachs, which is fun to say, and impossible to remember the name of the origin. It's impossible to remember the origins of the name. So, but, so there's the Beppo Colombo, which is the one that's named after Giuseppe Beppe Colombo, 1920 to 1984, and it's a mission to Mercury. And, and so Beppo Sachs is the X-ray, similar. And so, I mean, I guess, I don't know, that sounds good. Use the person's nickname for their first name, and then use their uh, actual name for the, for the, for the you know their last name and then just mash the two together i think it's all right so there's there's also all of the missions that have been named by kids by the public uh so the the gravitational mission that recently went and orbited the moon had two separate satellites a lay a, a leading one and a trailing one and those got named by kids ebb and flow that's cool so letting I think letting kids name your rovers is a good idea. Let, you know, naming your missions, but don't let your missions be named by Stephen Colbert. No, that's true. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, did you hear what they? So did you hear about that? They NASA put out a the word for a mission, and Colbert used the nation to uh, to try and get the spacecraft named after him, and they um, they turned him down, but. They uh, they did come up. They did name a treadmill after him. It's true, but yeah. who doesn't want a treadmill named after them? Yeah. So it is. Let me see if I can get it here. Uh, the combined operational load bearing external resistance treadmill, or Colbert, and that is literally <laughs> what the thing is named on the International Space Station. This is this is what the astronauts use to uh, to recover themselves to sort of try and maintain their muscle mass while they're on the International Space Station, which I think is just great. I saw a mock-up of the Colbert when I was at the Kennedy Space Center in the room where they have the Atlantis. They have a model of the Colbert, so you can actually go and check it out. That That yeah. is cool. But it gets weirder than this, right? Because it's not just the actual full missions themselves. The missions themselves have instruments, and the instruments on board all have their own names as well so so we have with new horizons we have the alice instrument which is another acronym um but but they worked it out so they had two instruments that were named after characters from the honeymooners so it's it's all of these crazy different things and it it largely comes from we're scientists who are forced to be all logical and mathematical and we get to use our creativity so rarely and we use it all up naming things and then we do it badly. This is just like one, oh, well, no, but I mean, this is like one, you know, one little way to express your creativity. So I think it's all right. And what's always interesting though is, is as we were just talking about, they do let the public name things and Often you end up with uh, names where the scientists are like, lame, that's lame. And one of my favorite examples of this is the Mars uh, landing laboratory that we all now call Curiosity. Everyone was originally like, no, we don't like the name Curiosity. So you saw the scientists always referring to it by its full name. And then you had everyone else just like, and we shall call it Curiosity, and it's the Curiosity rover. So there's this great MSL versus Curiosity. You could always tell is this a scientist or a hardcore, I shall use the right. proper terminology person versus, hey, the kid's named it Curiosity. That's kind of cool. Let's name it that. Well, you actually see both, right? Mm -hmm. So you see MSL Curiosity. Some people will use that. But so is... Curiosity was that named early, or was that that one was that one they released the name early, but it wasn't named after a human, so it had been named the Mars Science Laboratory since they initially proposed the mission because you have to name it something on the paperwork, 
And then as it was nearing time for launch, they they did the public drive on what shall we name it and curiosity came out of that. Right. So I guess, have you ever been involved in helping name something or be, you know, part of a group that's had to name something? Well, I, I named Cosmo well, Quest. Obviously, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and that, I have to admit, uh, the naming of CosmoQuest comes out of what URL is still available. That is how I named Universe Today. So even 17 years ago, there were, weren't a lot of names available. And so I just took spacey words and date words and just mixed and matched them until, until I got a, a domain name that was available. And that was that the name of my company. Yeah, so so I yes, this is how we name things today is based on what URLs are still available to purchase. Uh, but when it comes to, to fancier things, um, I luckily have so far avoided having to do that because I recognize there are certain skills I as a scientist should not pretend I possess. And the skill to name things is one of those things I shouldn't be allowed to do. Now, the way naming things works in the in the case of science missions and, and space missions, as you said, you know, in some cases it's named after a famous scientist, named after some person who was part of NASA, or is sort of given to the internet uh, to, you know, name it after various dirty jokes. Uh, but, you know, in regular academia, things are named after people who give the money, right? That does often happen. And one of the interesting things about the James Webb exception is James Webb was not a scientist. James Webb was a NASA administrator. And, and there's, there's actually some controversy surrounding his time as a NASA administrator. But he was also one of the ones who was responsible for help getting the Great Observatories programs, which is pretty much culminating in James Webb Space Telescope off and going and running. So it's it's fascinating just how these things end up happening. And what's even more interesting and part of what inspired the show is there's often this desire to give things names that match together. So we have Osiris Rex is going to the asteroid Bennu. So that is entirely death centered. So you have Egyptian god of the underworld, Bennu relates to the underworld as well. Now with the mission that recently came to a culmination, Rosetta, you have Rosetta, the main spacecraft and Philae, the lander. And what I love is how this ties in to translating ideas and figuring out how to uh, bridge from one set of things to another when we don't have a key. So comets are considered to be one of the keys for understanding solar system formation. And the Rosetta Stone was a stone that had things written out in multiple languages, allowing early translation. And the Philae obelisk also had both hieroglyphic, hieroglyphics and Greek lettering on it. And while it wasn't a one-for-one -one translation, there was enough overlap between the two that it started the process of being able to say, oh, this hieroglyphic means Ptolemy, this hieroglyphic means Cleopatra. And so there's this idea of we're going to translate our solar system, so let's name the missions after things that translate. SWIFT is another one where the idea behind SWIFT was to very quickly get your spacecraft on target to track down the, the gamma ray burst precursor objects to see those early afterglows so that we could identify what was the source of gamma rays. So SWIFT was just a straightforward name for this is what this telescope does quickly yes yeah yeah i i don't know so what about things like new horizons were you around when new horizons got its name i i wasn't well i mean i existed i was alive but i wasn't exactly part of that uh, discussion. right yeah cool because originally it was going to be i think pluto express yes and then, uh, and then a sort of a different mission got put together that was going to be called New Horizons. So a lot of cases, the missions have one name, and then as the final version of it comes together, like we're seeing this with the Europa Clipper, 
which yes. was the the previous Europa mission. But then it you know it's different enough. We don't even know. Do we even know what the new Europa mission is going to be called? Um, I don't think so no, yet. No, I don't think so. Maybe uh, the chat will probably tell us. But but this is one of those things that that if the mission is substantially changed from when it is in the planning stages to what the final mission is going to be it can often get a, a different name because the original name of the original team it's scrapped and then a new team comes forward and puts together a different mission and i think you know if you have a really great name for your mission and then your mission doesn't make it past the planning stages and then it moves into the next stage and it gets a complete, you know, and then you have to lose that name because then I guess there's like a negative brand associated with the mission. I'm not really <laughs> sure why this happens, you know. Like, are, can we never have a terrestrial planet finder? Is that is that name now destroyed? I don't right? know because Lisa keeps getting resurrected, and the idea behind that mission has has been changed ten million different times. So it's it's unclear exactly what happens in the years prior to launch and after launch? Uh, one thing I think is great is the naming convention that uh, SpaceX is taking with its barges. So uh, the names of them are like, of course I love you. Anyway, they're, they're the spacecraft from Ian M. Banks' books. And so oh, they actually that's took, cool. Yeah, so they took the names from this really cool science fiction series, the names of spaceships, and they named them the for the the actual um, the landing barges. And then they've done this again with the new spacecraft that's going to go with the interplanetary transport ship. They're calling it the Heart of Gold, which that's... which comes from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's the one that has the you know the um, uh, the infinite improbability drive, and uh, it's a wonderful name. Now, who knows? Like, if they actually crank up the the plans to colonize Mars, they're going to run out of names pretty fast. If they're going to be sending a thousand spacecraft carrying two hundred people at the same Mars window, you know, what do you, what do you call a thousand different spacecraft? But what about the space <laughs> shuttles? You know, they've got some great names. Some of the manned spacecraft. So, so with the with the space shuttles, there is a mixed set of origins. Enterprise was actually named after the Starship yeah, Enterprise from which is like, awesome. Gene Roddenberry series. Um, so there you have the the original, and then uh, Columbia was named after Columbus, which mixed emotions, but it was the 80s, different time. It was actually named in the 70s, very different time. Um, but then as you get to the newer ones, Endeavor was again named by kids. So you, you have this history of, of trying to inspire through the names as well as um, engage the public as much as possible with the names. Now, what's cool is we also periodically reuse spacecraft. And yeah. in the reusing, they also get renamed. So for instance, there's the new Neowise that is using the WISE telescope, which I, I love this particular story because WISE completed its survey, completed its whole plans for infrared mapping, and then got put into a parking orbit. So they didn't crash it through the atmosphere. It was completely safe up there. And then after a period of time, they were like, oh, we know how to use this again, and we shall use it again. And so it got repurposed into the NEOWISE, which is being used to look for near-Earth objects. So we now have the Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. And that is just cool. And then, well, literally, it's looking in the infrared. Um, and then we have the Kepler mission, which when it was no longer able to do its original core mission of sitting on one field, observing it forever with very, very precise, all the things. Um, when they brought it back online, it became K2. So it's Kepler 2. They're acknowledging this is a new mission, a new data set, and things are a little bit different now. And there's some that have gotten completely different names. And actually, the name is is escaping me. But there's a couple of missions that have actually gotten a completely different name because they've been given a completely different task from from what they were doing. 
it one of the comet missions that happened to and i'm i'm having the yeah. exact same mind blank you're having was it it wasn't deep space 1 i'm sure the chat's going to tell us but there was but it had like a lot of x's and and uh, in the name and i'm and i'm forgetting the name of the spacecraft but but it, but essentially it was a you know it was a mission that completed its main uh target and then had a second mission and it was given a completely new name, which is which is really cool. Um, and I love that. I love that idea. And I, you know, I can imagine. You know, of course, once Canada, once we volunteer to take over, you know, any of the missions that that y you Americans don't want to don't want to manage anymore, we'll give them good Canadian names. We'll rename <laughs> them. You know, we'll call that. You know, keep your eye on the puck or something like that. Well, you guys are always out there building an arm and giving everyone an extra hand when they need it. Oh, why can't I remember this name of this mission? Oh, I feel I feel so sad. So, what is your favorite name? Do you have a favorite I, spacecraft name? I I have to admit, Osiris Rex just pleases me to no end. And part of this is because I, for better or worse, have a long history of giving my computers very bleak names. So I have. Strider, which comes from the Lord of the Rings series. I have Styx, which comes from mythology. Eridani comes from mythology. And and so it's just like Osiris Rex fits in with all of my technology. And hopefully it will live as long as my technology lives. Because apparently when you name a computer after death, it's determined to ironically stay alive. <laughs> right. I think I like curiosity. I think that really encapsulates the mission and sort of what the purpose of science is. And I really, I really like that name. Now, my wife just chimed in and she likes the name, the Falcon and the Falcon Heavy. So she likes the naming those spacecraft, uh, those rockets after, uh, after birds, which is pretty cool. I, I have to admit that one of my favorite logos has been the t-shirts that people have done with free spirit for when the spirit rover got stuck in the yes. sand. Oh. And, and I just Poor love spirit. the wordplay that has been involved with, with spirit and opportunity. All right. Uh, let us know what you think is your favorite uh, name. Join us in the, in the chat next week. Thanks a lot, Pamela. My pleasure. Okay, I'm gonna stop my recording. And this is where we bore all of you as we save. E. Uh, and this is X. This is episode four twenty-five. Larry Beckham says Snoopy and Charlie Brown from Apollo. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Um, one recommendation for the folks talking in the chat. Uh, why don't you put a link to to the WSH crew website in the chat every, I don't know, 15 minutes or so? Because remember that this is being displayed live on YouTube. And then people are going to be like, how do I participate in this chat? And then that's down at the bottom of the show. And that way, if you actually put the 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 instructions in the chat that someone can follow that john john Sufel is suggesting the next mars lander should be named crunchy oh xmm newton oh uh acronym um i am now googling it for you um because i like you it is the Deep Space One extended mission. I, I feel like it was Deep Space One. That's what I thought it was yeah. too, but I wasn't succeeding in Googling. So, uh, of course, the wiki page for XMM Newton isn't being obvious. Um, but I remember with XMM Newton, it was always XMM, and then the Newton oh, got added Oh, I, I bet that its name was written in a uh, European language because it stands for High Throughput X-ray Spectroscopy Mission. And I'm guessing the X is X-ray and the MM is the high throughput spectroscopy, but in it, oh no, it's multi-mirror. That's what it is. X-ray multi-mirror mission. Found it. Sorry for the delays. Uh, so Sylvan Westby is saying in the chat that the lunar limbs were called Spider, Snoopy, Eagle, Intrepid, Aquarius, Antares, uh, Falcon, Ryan, Challenger. 
and you see when they no longer let the astronauts name the vessels. <laughs> Snoopy, I'm I'm guessing. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah, you know we should put it in the chat here. I'm gonna put it in the. I'm gonna put it in the chat that shows on the live video, so that way people can see it like that. Do that every 15 minutes or so. Oops. Hmm. Yeah, except then it auto completes, so it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Work. So it shows the. <laughs> that's a problem. You have to put spaces in. Do I? Hmm. Yep. So if does... you put spaces in, it doesn't embed it. Oh. Okay. I can do this. All right. You talk. I will do. No, no. It's, I'm sure someone will <clears throat> will fix my terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, <laughs> Thomas Tranicker says, next Mars lander, Venus. <laughs> that, would, that would be confusing. There you go. There you go. So if you want to, uh, <laughs> I think Sylvan figured it out. I'm not sure how yeah. he made it not bring in the, the link. But, um, but yeah, if you want to join the chat and join the inside community, these are the producers, not only of just of Astronomy Cast, but of the Weekly Space Hangout. They're the ones who figure out what guests we're going to have. They get to sort of see all the, the horrible, horrible behind the scenes. They have this terrible behind the scenes knowledge. Um, they also get to periodically have like panic me going, can you please come look at this? Before yeah, we yeah, me too. Time. Me too. I need three volunteers. Yeah. To, to help me with it. So if you want to be our super secret army of scientific good, yep. join the week, weekly space hangout crew. Oh, Tom Nathy just linked up eight repurposed missions. I'm about to find the name. Come on. I looked at that link. It wasn't there. Mm. It made me sad. It uh, became a spacecraft that began with the letter E. I'm just not. Yeah. E X. Oh, someone help me. Or we're just going to sit here and just Google <laughs> for all day together. Okay, so what questions? So when will we get a Colbert mission? We won't. NASA will not let that go. No, but we got a, we got a treadmill. I mean, they really reached out and extended the olive branch to Stephen Colbert. And I think he was, he was tickled that that, that, that happened. So a lot, Elad Averin names things the way I do. He says he has a cat named Cat, a cat, uh, another cat named Cat in Hebrew, a ginger cat named Ginger. I, I had an orange cat that I named Orangeva, which is the Russian word for orange. So my orange cat was named Orange. I'm not allowed to name things. I admit to I, this. It's fine. I named my, I named my first, I named my cat, or maybe my parents did, I'm not sure, my kitty. And our dog, when I was a child, was named Cain. So, so I guess is if you like, you take him in to see the vet, they would have called him Cain Cain. Because <laughs> I don't know when you take your dog into the vet, do they say? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I have Eddie McFlifflepaw gay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that is so great. Um. Oh, somebody help me find this mission. What's it called? This is apparently how you break Fraser and I. Is, is you, oh. like, the part of our brain holding this spacecraft is gone. Yeah. There was a mission. Like, it was like Deep Space One. It was some kind of experimental test bed for technology. They changed the name to something totally different. But it wasn't clearly, it wasn't Deep Space One. <sighs> Oh, well. All right. Um, ask us any questions if you want. Okay, so... We found it. I found it. Deep Impact Probe was renamed to... That's it. To... That's it. It was Deep Impact. Yes. But what was it renamed well, to? we'll get there. This we'll get there. It's driving me crazy. Epoxy. It was epoxy. renamed Epoxy. I had the letter E. I know, and okay. I, I knew there was an X in there. That's right. It was Epoxy. Okay. So the Deep Impact Extended <sighs> Investigation. All right. We're better now. Okay. Um, uh, so the names of the spa of the, of the drones, sorry, the, the, um, the landing barges are, uh, of course I still love you. Of course I love you. And read the instructions. Oh, I love that. Yeah. 
and those are in these E&M Banks books. <clears throat> uh, Fenson Schwitten says we need a Mars, a Hermes Mars ship and a Watney lander. It's true. We yeah. do. And I just want to say we have a giant nasty storm coming this way. So things here are going to get very noisy in a few minutes. I love, I love when, when you're in, her, in tornado season there. Yeah, like I'm starting, I've been, if you've seen me looking sideways, it's because I keep seeing lightning and I'm starting to hear it. And I just pulled up the weather radar and there is a giant swath of orange through red that is just now starting to cross the Mississippi. Wow. Uh, Tony Phillips asks, what's going on with Juno? So they delayed the burn they were going to do a, an orbital burn on juno to bring it down to a different orbit and they delayed the burn because there was a problem with the helium uh one of the helium tanks the pressure in the tank anyway so they're uh they're taking a few more days to sort of make sure that that it's okay before they actually do this this burn so uh it doesn't sound like there's anything catastrophically wrong with juno but it is an unusual delay. It's a year for the unusual. Um, so Fence Schwitzen asks, it would have been great if you announced the live stream on Twitter. So the best thing for you to do is to, is to when you've, if you subscribe to Astronomy Cast, when you subscribe to it, there's a little notification bell that you can choose. And that's like to super subscribe. So all the shows that you want to really be notified when they're happening live click on that little notification bell and then you'll get like an email your phone will freak out it's really the way to know when all this stuff is is happening because just i mean we try i mean if you look back in the astronomy cast twitter i'll bet you it says that we were going to be doing the live stream and it's i know it's in my calendar and so on and so forth but uh i know i will start doing broadcasts at the drop of a hat like literally whenever I have an idea for a new experiment, I will start a broadcast. Like Monday, we did uh, we played some games, some video games with my son and Dr. Paul Matt Sutter, which was a lot of fun. Two weeks ago, Nicole Gallucci and I watched Armageddon and you could have watched it with us. So that's the most dependable way is, is to sign up for notifications from uh, – yeah, from us. So and, subscribe and to subscribe to me at over at Universe Today, and then also subscribe to Astronomy Cast, and that way you get the notifications for either one. And and this one I have to say is on me because normally Fraser knows I'm going to be the one tweeting everything, but I I had one of those days where uh, I was dealing with hackers all morning because hackers hackers exist and they need to just stop and go yep. somewhere else. And uh, so my whole staff around lunchtime was like, don't you have to record astronomy cast today? And a string of expletives came out of my mouth. I ran to get lunch and then I ran to be on air. And um, yeah, that's on me. I'm sorry. It's actually on the hackers, but I'll take responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Those hackers. So you get me no makeup, messy hair. Yeah. Hackers. With a storm coming. That I can't take credit for. <laughs> um, well, you know, we, I think last week we were in the midst of three storms smashing into the coast, including, we talked about this, the, the third, uh, um, the remnants of a super typhoon and, but it all missed us. So it missed me here, but just tore up Vancouver. In fact, a, a poor kid died, like a 15 year old kid got hit by a tree walking home from school and a tree fell on him. Oh, God. Yeah, it was awful. There's really high winds in Vancouver. So so we, uh, yeah, we, we missed it. Oh, David Joseph Wesley wants to know if anyone else is getting weird symptoms from the super moon this past weekend. <laughs> You're about to get banned, David. That's, that's how. Yes. Um, yeah, no, you know what? There was an article on, I think, was it the New York Times? Someone was saying that, uh, that a lot of doctors and nurses think that uh, it's crazy, you know, things go crazy during the full moon. 
and that's confirmation bias. It's totally I know absolutely totally confirmation bias. It doesn't actually happen, right? Uh, but the other thing that's going around right now is I don't know if you remember last year someone there was a myth, uh, hoax really going out that there was uh, there was going to be like fourteen days of total darkness. And, and, you know, that NASA had confirmed and that Charlie Bolden said that we're going to have to, you know, uh, experience this dark. Totally not true. Total hoax. And yet people just fell for it. And now the thing is coming back again. Uh, a whole nother round of it. I can't, I can't, oh, I can't believe now, it. There was a paper that came out recently that said that there is a correlation between the moon being overhead and earthquakes. But overhead is not the same thing as full. Right, right. Uh, you can have a, uh, the moon can be close and big, or it can be farther close away and, and smaller, and it can be full or new, and it you know doesn't really have any difference between, you know, the two don't necessarily line up. Although I think what, what David is, was mentioning uh, was that it is going to be a supermoon on the 16th? I think uh, it was like two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, but, uh, there's another, but there's another super moon coming up. Anyway, it's like th three big moons because they, they sort of tend to be because of the way the lunar cycle and the, and the monthly cycle sort of sync up, you get, you know, you can get big, big moons. <laughs> uh, Nancy's suggesting confirmation bias. That's a good topic. Ooh. Yeah. It um, is. Uh, Especially this election series, but it is like the, one of the, best super moons i think in the decade in the in the century anyway it's it's big super moon. of course the super moon right is all you just get is you get the time of the full moon is very close to the time when the moon is at the closest point at its uh apogee no that's the highest point perigee, perigee. yeah so um weird David says but, that his vision changes yeah, with the full and, moon. Huh, that's really interesting. I wonder I wonder what's what happens with that. It could be a coincidental alignment of a body cycle cuz I mean, human beings are nothing if not cyclic. It's yeah. women are evidence of that. The Oh, you let everyone want to get Steve Novella to talk about confirmation bias. Uh, I can reach him. Yeah, I'll get them. You should actually talk to him about doing another back and forth. They come visit us. We visit. Yeah. Them. Well, I was just on the Skeptics Guide about a month ago, talking about the Proxima Centauri planet. So, so he owes us for sure. Let's get him. Let's get him on the show. That's it. We'll do a crossover with the folks from the Skeptics Guide. That'd be great. Um. Yeah. Oh, and Tom Nathan's been dealing with Nibiru hoaxes. I, I would love... <laughs> yes, we've got it in the I, first week, too. I know, I know. I, it's funny. Like, I, I go back, and Phil Plate, I think, was the first person who was really taking on the Nibiru hoaxes. Yeah. Before he was blogging. Like, like yeah. when Phil and I first met in, like, 1999, 2000... He was battling Nibiru, had been battling Nibiru mm -hmm. hoaxes for a few years now already. Like, I think he's got posts that go back to, like, 97. Yeah. I'd, love to, I'd love to talk to Phil and do a, sort of a retrospective on debunking Nibiru. Because we have now, you know, my We've children. We've been doing this for, like, generations. Yeah, you know, we were debunking Nibiru hoaxes. I got married. We had children. We were debunking Nibiru hoaxes. I got divorced. I got married again. Still debunking Nibiru hoaxes. Like it has just been Nibiru okay, hoaxes. Okay, that is not the standard you should be using to mark time. Gone for decades and decades. Soon I'm going to retire. We will be debunking Nibiru hoaxes. And then I will pass along the torch to my children. They will debunk Nibiru hoaxes. It's just gone on forever. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, the 2012, right? I mean, I just said it's the great example. And I, I had you hoped. You know, while you stayed nice and safe playing on the beach, many of us almost died on a Mexican <laughs> ferry on December 20th. It's true. It was almost Armageddon for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that that's a story I will blog at some point. But 
uh, some of the people that I was on that ferry with are now my closest friends in the whole wide world, but we did almost die together. <laughs> yes. Hopefully the, our, our chasing an eclipse is going to be a lot safer. Yeah, there's going to be no Mexican ferries involved or high waves at full moon. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, – that was – I'm really – like it would have been nice to see those ruins and, you know, miss the apocalypse. But I'm kind of glad we stayed on the boat for, for that one for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm just going to bite my tongue. <laughs> I feel like I made the right call. Um. Yeah, so right. So Michael Myers noting that we switch from reality to a simulation during the not the end of the world cruise. That's that may happened. be true. Yeah, that's true. Um, cool. Well, I think we've reached the end of our hour, uh, reached the end of this episode. Is there anything that needs to be shamelessly self-promoted? Um, What's happening right on now. Cosmo Quest? How's, how's Cosmo Quest going? It's going well. We're getting ready for a big site design. Um so stay tuned. That'll be a week or so away. And I see Michael My Mayer saying that I promised we'd do a T-shirt for the ferry trip, and it's still on my list of things to do. Um, so, so that trip in 2012 uh, led into the whole, oh, dear God, financial ruin is upon us as NASA cut, cut back funding. Um, so I have a massive to-do list of things that haven't happened in three years because I've been raising funds for things. Yep, yep. Well, we still have a list of people that we were going to reach out to and remind, let them know about the upcoming Eclipse trip. I don't know if that's... I think they all found us already. Oh, have they all found us already? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, Susie counted up the names and we're already up uh, to around 80 people. And we have room for 100? Yes. Yeah. I haven't even made a video on my YouTube channel yet, which I'm about to do, so... You may not need to. Talk to Susie about whether or not we have space to add another bus. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, my instinct is more equals better, but I've not sure but more we, equals better. I, and, and I don't know if the hotel we're in has a room for more people. Right. And if we have to find more hotels and more rooms and larger. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. So if you're kind of on the fence and but you think you're more sign on the fence. Sign up now. Yeah. Sign up now. You can always sell your slot to somebody else later. Yeah. So. Um. Oh, uh, so apparently there's a NASA press conference on Juno Live right now. So maybe I'll go watch that. And Michael Harmer is noting that the Halley's Tail meteor shower, the Orin Orinids, the Ori Orin. Orionids, is, yeah. is happening just in, what, Friday, I think? Yeah. I'm stoked. So stay tuned. There is much more science to come. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and so we'll be back on Friday with the Weekly Space Hangout as normal. So uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Pamela, as always, for helping us name things. Thanks to the chat for, uh, for joining us along this uh, mission. And uh, we'll see you all normal time next week, right? That is a plan. Title to be figured out. Although confirmation bias is starting to... That one sounds really That sounds cool. super good. Let's totally do that. Okay. Um, right. I'm passing it on to Susie before we forget. Susie, we love you. All right. <laughs> we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.